uh, now the second consecutive time as the Wellbeing Culture Forum. The last one um, was in cooperation with uh, Serpentine um, about how art can free architecture. Um, we started actually this Wellbeing uh, Culture Forum as a closed think tank already in March this year, also in the wake of COVID-19. And then we, we started to do some public sessions. There's a quite big um, number of people now involved in uh, just talking about how our future can be shaped into more well-being. And this is connected with, with the thought that either we are well or we are sick. Yeah, so we are sick or well. So when we are not well, we are already um, decreasing. And this is something that, uh, that uh, especially now um, in the current situation is, um, is uh, very visible um, that uh, things are coming together uh, in a way that uh, we, we are anticipating, you know, a kind of need for change. Maybe it's uh, comparable with the last century when Bauhaus started a revolution of how, you know, after the Manchester capitalism started, uh, we have John McGrath here from uh, the Manchester International Festival, welcome. Um, and also um, from the factory that will reshape um, as we uh, think uh, the city of Manchester. Um, uh, and we have also Robert Hania here from uh, Thermal Group, the CEO and chairman of the board, uh, with the project that we plan to uh, build in Manchester. Um, we hope also to be a part of this. So Manchester is an important, you know, fixed point in our in our universe. Uh, it's uh, somehow also a point, uh, a symbolic uh, city for the whole world, because this is where the Manchester capitalism started, and people moved from the from the countryside into, into the cities, they had to completely change the way how they live uh, uh, instead of being in a holistic environment with animals, with big family communities. Uh, they, they suddenly found themselves in little flats uh, pressed into, into the city. And Bauhaus was a cultural movement that tried to completely change this and to propose another form of living and another form of organization. And I'm super happy to have here also S. Devlin um, on our board. We are talking a lot uh, with each other. We're talking about how we can implement uh, plans uh, into the city, how we can do it in a symbolic form, in an artistic form, and also in a form that will engage um, people. Uh, because it's all about people um, and uh, how people come together. This is the topic of this talk, it's the life culture. I was thinking a lot about what, what means life culture, what means being life. And I think being life first and foremost means that we are together with other people, right? So life is a form of life, of really living, of being alive. Because if we are here together in the Zoom call, it's a kind of representation of life. So um, uh, Franklin, we are meeting the first time um, here in the Zoom call. I can't wait to meet you also live. You said something, uh, I mean, there was many sad events uh, happening in the past months. Um, one of this was uh, the death of uh, Christo, one of the very, very big artists that we met uh, in his last big installation at the Serpentine. And uh, I see here the quote uh, of your Instagram um, account when you said that back then the island project of Christo 1983 was the project to unify people. He did his art out of fear. Um, this is what you wrote on your Instagram. But, um, but he, uh, the effect of his art was the, the unification of communities to come together. Zoe, I also welcome you. We had this amazing talk, The Right to Refuse, uh, during the during the Venice Biennale um, as a part of our support for the, for the uh, pavilion um, of Great Britain. Um, you did this amazing exhibition and um, we, we will also follow up with another talk uh, with the British Council um, in, in four weeks right now. And uh, we, we are thinking back on, on, um, on the panel that we had together and we're very happy that you're here. Also Konstantin, Konstantin Shiryak, he is the, um, the founder and president of one of the most important um, festivals of theater um, in the world. It's happening in Sibiu, in Romania. We are now in a talk marathon connected with this festival. We are very, very happy to have you here. 
And last but not least, Mark Spiegler. Max, a good friend and um, here the co-host of this forum. And I will now also stop talking and we'll give the word to you, Mark, to, to start this, uh, this debate. Um, you, you are basically in a very special position because you just uh, launched Art Basel online, the very first time that, that Art Basel is happening, um, is happening uh, not uh, uh, live, but, but, but online. Um, uh, yeah, some thoughts about this, Mark, maybe as an introduction to this, to this panel. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Mikolai. Um, and greetings to everybody from Zurich. Um, as, as Mikolai said, we, we launched today the second edition of our Art Basel online uh, viewing rooms, and it's not Art Basel happening online. It's, 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 a, ver it's a, a part of what Art Basel is, but obviously I think you know, given what we're talking about today is the culture of live events, you know, what's what's missing um, in this platform is as great as it is, and as well as many galleries are doing today, is human interaction. You know, it's it's falling in love with an artist who you've never seen the work of before. It's meeting a gallerist who is going to teach you things. It's meeting a collector who is going to patronize your programs. It's meeting a collector who's going to support your museum. It's discovering an artist who's going to go in your biennial. So all these things are not happening in the same way as they would in person. And I think, um, you know, I was thinking a little bit about this panel um, as I was walking home from launching the, 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 the from launching it with my with my team. Um, and I was thinking, you know, it's there's a there's a great book. Um, many of you may have read it uh, by Elias Canetti called Crowds and Power. The original is Masso und Macht. And what he talks about in that book, among many other things, is how a crowd is a kind of organism and a crowd comes together and its purpose is to sustain itself. But also the people within the crowd subsume their identities to the crowd itself. And it, ha it becomes a kind of... Um, an animal and, and a, a, a being, you know? And I think he talks about many crowds. He talks about the types of audiences that all of us benefit from. He talks about, he talks about the crowds of, of a military unit. He talks about the crowds of a, of a festival. I mean, he, he wrote this long before raves, but that's one example. I mean, he talks about, of course, you know, what happens in the context of a riot or a protest or religious mass. And I think all of these are things which are inherently human events and which cannot really take place virtually you know and i'm not here to be the the, the luddite on the panel because i i do believe strongly the original and a lot of interesting things have happened but i think i was thinking about sort of the special nature of a lot of people coming together being together and what it means to to have to be together in a room and experience something you know and i think and then I started thinking about the people on this panel and I was thinking, and, and I'm, I'm happy to be proven wrong in my thinking and no doubt I will be in a couple of minutes, but I was thinking that we have a sort of continuum, you know, and on the one hand, we have the people from the, the theater and performance world where generally speaking, an event, a performance takes place at a certain time and people come together to watch the event and it, the performance could be, you know, it could be a, a three day long, 10 hour per day opera, or it could be a 15 minute you know, event, um, you know, and then you have in, the, then at the other hand, let's say in the middle, you have what I do as an art fair director, which is to, to bring people together around an exhibition, but it's an exhibition which that which lasts a very short time. And there's a, there's an incredible kind of energy, which I was really missing yesterday when I was, when I was on Messeplatz in Basel, it was, you know, sadly, or ironically, or in a bittersweet way, I happened to come to work precisely at the moment when normally everybody comes streaming through the doors and to feel the vacuum on Messe plots was, was borderline heartbreaking. But there's a particular energy that happens. And then, you know, six days later, all the art disappears and the walls go back into storage and, and it's done, you know, and then museums are in a different way. And I'll, I'll let um, Franklin and Zoe talk about this, but what's definitely clear is that the museum of today is not just an exhibition where people come and look at art. You know, on the one hand, I think, you know, if you've ever had the pleasure of being alone or virtually alone in a museum for four hours, after hours, you know, on a Tuesday morning, it's a different thing to see art there without other people around you. Um, but, and yet, and again, I'll let Zoe and Franklin go into details. I think what's, what's definitely clear is that 
not only in terms of the, the general thinking about museology, but also in terms of the specifics of what's happening during this crisis, the museum is also a place where communities are built and where communities coalesce and where co communities unite. Um, you know, I mean, I, I uh, you know, I was, um, Zoe and I did a panel together a few weeks ago and Anne Pasternak from the Book Museum was talking about how the crisis has sort of shifted her thinking about what the museum is and accelerated her thinking. But you know, what's interesting is that, you know, last weekend, the, the Brooklyn Museum was not the site of an exhibition, but it was the site of a massive rally um, for the, you know, for the trans Black Lives Matter movement, you know, and then we had this amazing Supreme Court decision a couple of days later. But the point is that I think that's not in the traditional thinking of the museum. And so one of the questions I think is interesting is, is how do all of us who are dealing with events in different ways see how things are changing? And I think the, you know, I think it would be good to go around the table, so to speak, and sort of talk, you know, maybe we, we'll start with theater and then go, and then go, you know, to museums. But I think the real question is, how does what's happened change the nature of events, short-term and long-term? And also, how do we square everything that I said before, which may be completely wrong, um, about the nature of crowds, the, what, what a crowd does in terms of the performance, how do we square that with the virtual world and all the great things that can happen as well in that space? Um, should we start, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a little bit old school and say ladies first, can I start with S, Devlin? And, and maybe I'm curious, you know, what your thoughts are, you know, as someone who, who has, you know, really gone into theater in quite an innovative way, how do you see things changing now within within the space that you're in? Short term, long term, where does the digital play in? Okay, um, thank you so much. Um, listen, because I've been talking a fair amount lately uh, and I'll just preface what I'm about to say because I tend to come off as somewhat positive in my enthusiasm for all these extraordinary uh, interventions, innovations that we've been provoked into having to consider. So before I share my enthusiasm for some, some of them, I have to preface all of it by saying there's nowhere I would rather be right now than in the middle of a field of 100,000 people screaming and dancing and spitting and uh, yeah, doing what I normally do once a week. So <laughs> before I show you all my enthusiasm for what we have to do now, um, I must tell you that. Um, so what I did in preparation for this talk a little bit because I found a bit like Mikolai, I hadn't really considered why we use the word live. And I looked up in my little online etymology dictionary, the first use of the word live in this context. And it, unsurprisingly, uh, the first recorded use of the word live in relation to a live event is 1934. So we only ever started calling things which were always live, live in, uh, distinct, to distinguish them from pre-recorded. So it was live as opposed to recorded, that's what it meant. So all of this is us defining ourselves uh, in relation to uh, recorded versions of ourselves. And of course, in the 1930s, that meant one thing and it's meant uh, progressively more things as, as we've powered through our um, digital uh, adventures. Um, but, but, but really, when I gave it some more thought, I thought, what does it really mean? It really is talking about the nature of shared time. Um, and that's what it was really trying to tell you when it first was used in 1934. This is time that's being lived in a moment together. Breaths are happening uh, in that same moment of the world turning, uh, whereas when it's recorded, it's slightly offset in time. Um, so that's what I think this is really all about, is how do we define ourselves in relation to time? Um, and, you know, in, in my world, the piece that I was right in the middle of making uh, in March was uh, all about collective singing. I was making a piece where the show couldn't start until everyone sang. And I had been doing a lot of research into the health uh, uh, implications of, of collective singing. And it's of course well documented that uh, if you sing together, your levels of endorphins rise and you are kinder to each other. You are more empathetic, empathetic to each other. And of course, what I read today is that you know there is nothing more toxic right now than singing together. Um, you know the aerosols that we give off when we project. Uh, there couldn't be anything more lethal right now than being near each other and singing. 
and choirs have been some of the you know most super spreading uh, events. So that that's what we're faced with. Um, what I will say is, of course, the Zoom aspect. Um, the Zooms where the Zoom is live, is particularly, there have been some very successful examples of Zoom theatre where the audience remain present and vocal throughout the performance. There was a huge concert just now, I'm sure you're all aware of the big BTS concert that uh, many millions attended live and were able to give their feedback to. What, what's good about it is that a Zoom doesn't have a door. Um, you don't, uh, it levels out the demographics of those who are able to attend. The ethnicities and the social demographics and the age demographics and the ability de demographics are leveled out. So I guess what we must do is take all of that with us, uh, take it with us into the new architecture. Let's, let's, everything we've learned from this period, I guess, we take it into the architectures and the systems as we hopefully emerge. John, do you want to speak from the theater world next? Sure. Um... I've done some slides, so uh, partly because I'm bored of the sight of myself on a Zoom screen. So let me see if I can upload those and um, we'll see if it works. So. How is that? Is that showing? Very yes. good. Lovely. Okay. Um, so on June the 29th, 2017, just a few weeks after the Manchester Arena attack killed 22 people and injured many more, Manchester International Festival opened with a new work of public art and performance, What is the City But the People, conceived by Jeremy Della. One by one, over 100 citizens, ranging from a 99-year-old lady mm. to a mother and newborn, from a rape survivor to a refugee, from an anarchist collective to a family of bakers, each walked a 100 meter fashion runway in the middle of the city. An extraordinary act of recovery and community at the time, this work now also seems like a rehearsal for the future. What does the space of the city become when pandemics of virus and systemic violence threaten everything we value about that city? Its venues, its transport systems, its underground spaces, and yes, its crowds. Cities are about gathering and exchange. That's why they were born, in ports, on merchant routes, in locations like Manchester, ideal for industry. And gathering in new ways must be their future. At MAF, we work deeply and over the long term with the city's many and diverse communities to explore ways to gather and exchange. Projects like Tanya Bergera's School of Integration or our initiative Festival in My House where community members curate their own international festivals in their homes for their neighbours are all about ways of hosting and sharing knowledge in new democratic and lateral ways. Scale and excitement are also crucial to our experience of cities. Many of MIF's most significant projects have been epic in their scale, from our very first show, Damon Albarn's Monkey Journey to the West, to our presentation with Art Angel, of Heine Goebbels, everything that happened and would happen, from the life and death of Marina Abramovich to Bjork's Biophilia, we have often encouraged artists to make some of their biggest, boldest work in Manchester. And while we aim to put sustainability at the heart of everything in the future, ambition should still be central too. And we're particularly excited by conceptual ambition, projects like Yoko Ono's Bells for Peace, where thousands of individuals gathered to realize the artwork. Space will be different in our new reality and virtual digital space will be integrated into the physical. Our new OMA design venue, The Factory, is very flexible in its architectural proposition. Audiences and artists will be able to gather in an infinite variety of ways. But it is not only architectural, it is simultaneously virtual. And we're already commissioning artists to premiere work in the virtual factory this year, while the physical building is still rising from the ground. The future of cities will need to be more creative than ever, flexible, responsive, inventive. MIF and the factory are drawing on our practices of democratic exchange, ambitious new forms and technological integration to imagine our way into this future. Thank you.
and I will try and unshare. Thank you very much. That's really impressive. We see what we are missing. <laughs> Constantine, last but not least, from the theater world, how do, how do things look from your perspective? Well, I started this festival 27 years ago. There was only three countries and eight shows was just after the communism, just after, let's say, the prison. And it was the sign of freedom and the desire of dialogue and the necessity of the community to express themselves as people. So step by step, we learn to do a festival. And we arrived last year to have 585 different shows selected from around 15,000 applicants. And we are playing in 75 different venues with around 78,000 spectators. You can imagine to have 75 different venues and to have all the tickets sold out. The festival was the engine of the culture capital of Europe in 2007, when Romania entered also in European Union. But still at that time, we built step-by-step step what means to involve the community. So the biggest achievement that we did, Sibiu now, it is the city with the highest rate of money for culture in the world. I'm not joking. Imagine we have between 14 and 18 percent of the entire budget of the city for culture. But what it is really fantastic, because of the culture agenda that we develop, we are bringing back to the community 4 percent plus. We gave to Romania, the president of Romania, the former mayor of Sibiu that was working with us for the culture capital of Europe, for the festival and so on, now is the second time elected as president of Romania. So what it is really extraordinary as achievement is building the new audience. I have in my hands the National Theatre with 68 actors employed. And I have in my repertory 121 different shows. All the tickets for all the shows are sold out since five years ago. And the secret was building the new audience, bringing miracle each year, the highest quality coming from outdoor to opera, to dance, to flamenco, to gospel, we are playing in 21 different churches. So all the tickets are sold because we gave all the outdoor shows for free. So the implication of the community, it is so powerful. We did also the culture market to bring the producers, to bring the agents, to bring, you know, what means the engine of the new creativity. We developed also in the university, a theater school, a dance school, and the culture management school with a special dimension in what means leadership. In the middle of this big festival, we have a festival of theater schools, performing arts schools coming from all over the world. In the same time, we build it the biggest program of volunteering we are working with around 15,000 applicants and we are selecting 600. All the volunteers that are coming from all over the world, we are putting them in the houses of Romanians. They have kids or relatives the same age. So they are spending one month in Romania. They learn what it means to cook in Romania, to live in Romania, to have this fabulous experience, you know, to be two weeks in the festival, one week to learn what means if you end up to that, to have an evaluation, what we'll do after that. We are doing so, so many projects. So 
I need to talk so much on it. So I think it is enough what I said since now, because everything was prepared to be presented this year with 585 shows. So I pushed the festival as the Olympic Games for the next year. And in 67 days, I'm doing an online festival with what are the most important now in the world. And I have the biggest shows from Peter Stein to Lev Dodi, from Declan Danelan to Pippo Del Bono, from Necrosius to Ostermeyer, from Eugenio Bor Barba to Christopher Likowski, from Silvio Purcarete to Luke Parsebal, from Rimas to Minas to Jan Lauers, from Milo Rao to Emmanuel de Marcimota, from Hideki Noda to Robert Wilson, from Angela Gheorghiu to Peter Sellers, from Johanna Mori to Sasha Waltz, from Akram Khan to Michel Noiré, Vertigo, Kibbutz, Maria Pahes, Group F, Oposito, Teatro de Eventi, and so on. It is really something fantastic. And believe me, these days we have more than 100,000 audience online. Okay. Daily. So I'm going to segue, or we're going to segue rather, from theater to the, the arts world, to the fine arts world. And I'm, I would, I guess I'll start with Zoe, Franklin, if you don't mind. Um, and Zoe is in the very surreal position of, of running an institution, starting to run an institution immediately as it was going into lockdown. And so in a sense, to the extent that you're active, it's digitally active, but I'm curious, obviously, you know, you've put a lot of thought into, into what the Chisholm Hale Gallery will be and given given where it is and given its history and given the future that you're designing for it. So, I mean, I'm curious, where do you see events fitting in? Where do you see the community fitting in to, to the mission, you know, now and then obviously as soon as you can reopen your doors? Well, thanks, Mark. And thank you, Mikolai and everyone at Terramic Group for having me. Um, I think I've been thinking nonstop about that, losing sleep about it. Um, maybe it's something in the water in Southeast London, but I'd prepared for this in the same way that Ez did and started looking back at the history of liveness. And um, I won't repeat what she'd said, but I'd gone back to revisit um, Philip Oslander's book about liveness and was thinking about, in a nutshell, how much liveness relies on um, being produced through our engagement. So, you know, you and I could physically be in a room together, which, you know, unfortunately we can't be at the moment, but if I'm on my phone scrolling and doing something else, then, you know, the liveness is compromised to a great extent already. And so I think that thinking through what used to be a concern about a fear of missing out um, or only having to experience something vicariously, I think there's a new way for us all to rethink what um, a British thinker, um, Nick Caldry has referred to as group liveness or um, the ways in which we can create co-presence. And um, for those of you who aren't aware of Chisholm Hale Gallery, um, we are a small gallery in the East End of London, but we work with visual artists on new commissions, often at very, pivotal moments in their careers that go on to have um, a great deal of visibility and renown internationally. And I think at times like this, it's so important for institutions to really think about their, their DNA, you know, what makes us who we are. Um, and so it was very important for us, rather than to transform, say, into a digital entity, but to think about what it means to be an artist-led organization in this moment. And certainly for us, a lot of that had to do with answering um, a very immediate need that with physical exhibitions and commissions and projects being postponed or canceled, um, what that meant to offer support for artists to either show their existing work um, or to create uh, smaller commissions, but that resulted in um, some sources of paid work. Um, it also means rethinking how it is we work. So if you define yourself primarily as an innovator, or someone who brings ideas to the table, um, how do you think really meaningfully about the nature of collaboration? 
that you don't have to be the first or the only, but that you can work in partnership with other people. Um, in that respect, we teamed up with other artists. Um, Tai Shani, who was recently part of the um, four-way landmark win of the Turner Prize, um, commissioned transmissions with um, Hannah Nora Lee and Anne Dufo as a way to basically create um, a really fantastic outlet for artists to be paid for new television commissions that are streamed on Twitch TV. Um, so Chisholm Hale's gotten involved as a co-commissioner of what will be season two. Um, we're rethinking what it means to be in the gallery where you might be able to experience aspects of the exhibition at home. Um, you know, how might we use their people, you know, to Ez's point, um, they're people who have a PlayStation, but who don't visit galleries. You know, what might we be able to do online? Uh, a friend of mine from college, a comedian named Jenny Yang, um, did a wonderful fundraiser on Animal Crossing, you know, using the Nintendo Switch to create uh, a comedy club venue so that people were able to um, not only experience um, a very dynamic cross-section of comedy in a moment when people are hurting for all sorts of reasons of um, a really raw acknowledgement of racism worldwide, um, but to turn that into something that is good and that can be generative. So I think also within that, you know, some of us are aware that even while we want to, um, I think, create a sense that Zoom or other video platforms are providing these alternative spaces. For me, it's really um, redoubled an effort to think about what it means to create a safe space. I think it relates to, to Manchester as well. As we know, there are um, racists or you know, anti-trans lobbyists who make a point of um, trying to breach various Zoom meetings or safe spaces virtually. So what does it mean once we're back in our physical spaces to ensure that those are safe for you know, the artists we care about, for the audiences we work with? All of those things are, are part of my um, like very real and present thinking around how that kind of shared engagement and co-presence can be um, kind of meaningful and, and productive, you know, whether we're in the same physical room together or not. Thank you, Zoe. Last but not least, Franklin, um, is your museum open? I've lost track of what's happening in Miami now. No, we, we've been closed since March 16. Um, I think, you know, in, in light of the conversation, and firstly, thank you, Mark. Thanks for uh, having me and Terme, thank you for having me, Nicole. I appreciate it. Um, and sure. panelists. Um, we started as an institution in 1984. And Nicola, you mentioned it, the passing of Christo having a particularly strong resonance for us because our founding director, Jan Vandermark, worked with Christo for over 30 years. And actually, the first project that I would consider to be a kind of the beacon of, of contemporary art in Miami is 1983 is Surrounded Islands. Um, that whole project was about participation, obviously, was about the type of brilliance that Christo and Jean-Claude brought to all of us in terms of bringing people together, in terms of creating moments in which dialogue cross-cultural conversations, all of these things had the potential for happening. And I think of that very much as the genesis of a conversation on contemporary art in this city. Our museum opened seven months after that project with Jan van der Mark. And I think he took that spirit you know, being a museum in Miami at that time, it's not like we had a huge museum down the street. We had the bass on Miami Beach. Um, there was not the same sense of offerings as many cities uh, in this country, at least. And so the idea that we could be a place for people to come together was very much a part of our formation. This idea of creating a physical space for people to be 
together and particularly in that moment, which is a moment that we must reflect upon so often uh, to the moment we find ourselves in now, is that our museum was founded very much in a time and space where our city was undergoing a lot of racial distrust uh, in the wake of a killing in 1979 of a guy named Arthur McDuffie, which caused protests similar to the ones we are seeing now throughout our city in the early 80s. Um, we also had the backdrop of the Mariel boat lift, which is sort of second uh, massive uh, generation of immigration from Cuba. Uh, so you had a, a, a sense of a place that was not understanding each other, a place that needed um, a physical uh, bridge to come together. And I think we were we, we were founded upon some of those ideas. We began as a center for fine arts, which was mainly just a place to bring people together. There was no permanent collection. That came 10 years later. And with that permanent collection, we called ourselves Miami Art Museum. Like we were going up from being a center to a museum. Then we became Perez Art Museum Miami in 2013 and opened this beautiful building done by Herzog and Demuron, a place that is built off of the vernacular architecture of our situation here on the water in the Caribbean and a place that kind of sits on stilts. It is a incredible venue for bringing people together. And that's what we do. We are driven by that mission. And all of that is, is now something that we have to completely reconsider. I am, I am anxious and feel like this is an incredible opportunity for all of us to create a, in a way, an alternate future. Um, not that I wasn't excited about the future that we had, but I just feel like we have the sense right now of being able to create something quite different. And it involves a connection to audience that is going to be totally different, right? So if everything we did in the past was about creating more, 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 bringing in more people, right? And here in this little city, we were bringing in at 1.300,000 people a year. How do we move forward with this idea in a COVID uh, universe uh, filled with social distancing? How do we create this same sense of, of collegiality, of camaraderie, and of um, the potential in, in physical uh, happenings together? Is something that we're all confronting. And I think that there are positives and negatives on both sides. We're sitting here today, different time zones, different places, and having this conversation. And I've always find that to be such an incredibly, uh, you know, one of the many silver linings of this moment. We do a program here called Local Views, which focuses on artists from Miami and South Florida. And we would do that in the museum pre-COVID and we would have a nice intimate group of about 20 people on Thursday evening. Now we have an intimate group on, on digital resources of a hundred and people are logging in from all over place and getting this, this, this opportunity to convene together. So how do we build off of the many positives of this incredible moment uh, to, to create a world anew? And if anything, for us here in Miami, and I can't say you know only here, but everywhere, we're all feeling it. What has happened in the last few weeks after the killing of George Floyd and the focus that we now put on social justice, the focus that we now have on systemic racism, all of these things uh, give us a, a new positioning in the post-COVID universe to consider ways in which we create a better world for lack of a better word. Um, so I'm anxious and, and, and feel uh, optimistic about that. Uh, Franklin, I cannot tell you how, um, how moved I am by actually every word you, you are saying, because um, this is exactly how we feel. Uh, the situation during COVID was already, um, I, 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 I were not sure. So I, I wasn't sure if, if um, I'm dreaming or if I woke up from a dream. Yeah, somehow uh, this COVID situation showed us that basically a lot of things that, that we took for granted were just totally wrong. 
And now it feels like we are all on a big ship that is somehow sinking, not really sinking, but we are, you know, having our fights on the ship, but the ship itself uh, needs to be rebuilt. And it's exactly this moment where we have the chance to do it. I have to refer to our last talk um, uh, about art and architecture with uh, Sumaya from Counterspace, with Frida Escobedo, with, uh, with um, Yunya Ishigami, with Hans Ulrich Obris, Stefano Boeri, and uh, the amazing Tokuasa Dyson. And it was in the wake of the death of George Floyd. And uh, uh, Tokuasa said, um, when I asked her if the city is killing us, she answered uh, that uh, she said, my work as an artist is to say how in front of a store in a corner of a city with police and with the burden of white industrial, uh, white supremacy, how his face got on that ground. So that ground and that concrete, that pavement where he was killed is the question. So she, she's opening up a context and the context is the city. And you cannot imagine, and maybe we underestimated, you know, somehow the power of aesthetics, the power of, you know, uh, that everything should be in balance, that everything should have a kind of, um, a, or has a kind of connection. We see through COVID somehow that we are communicating even when we are not talking on a molecular level with each other. So being live means also to exchange all the time bacteria. We are hosting, you know, 60% of the cells of our body is actually non-human cells that we are all the time exchanging with each other without seeing it, without feeling it, without being aware, but still doing it. And it's a part of our existence. It's a very strong part of how we, you know, develop into something new, into something and how we also replicate. Uh, so this kind of life element of, if it's an art fair of, uh, of Mark Spiegler at Basel, where the people are not only there to buy art or see art, but they are there to see each other and to see each other in the context of this art, because every artist is creating this art in the context of, a, uh, of the reception and the reception itself is already a creative process or uh, Constantine's, um, Constantine's description of this amazing festival. You know, you can immediately see it in front of, of your inner eye how these people are, uh, are united, you know, united in something good and something creative and something that is beautiful. The same uh, with John McGrath's uh, example uh, of uh, Manchester and how Manchester could react to a tragedy with something that was filled with, uh, with joy, that was filled with hope, with something that, uh, that changed the course and the narrative. And also Zoe's uh, example of, of this small space, but has made it a space that is actually uh, building a very real community that is creating a space for a community to develop, not to consume something, not something that is already you know created by somebody else just to be bought and and consumed, but uh, something that you can participate in creating. And I think there's a very thin line between the riot and the festival, yeah, because every riot has a element of a festival because the people want to be together and they want to create together and the question is because what what we saw through you know through the past years that festival culture became a leading culture of escape because we have to escape the city into something else you know because the city itself took away all this free space all the space that is a space for creation and and this is where I want to um, ask Robert to tell a little bit about our vision um, and the vision that he's also uh, mainly responsible for. We talked a lot about it. How So what, what we try to do with Therma is we try to create the spaces, like we try to take the museum and to work with the museum together, like, like we hope that we will work together with the factory in, in Manchester, like we work with the Serpentine Gallery. And we try to get also this feeling of the festival and the feeling of simply vacations, you know, the moment when we leave the city, leave the space where we struggle and we, we can be ourselves, we can be humans and bring it back into our daily lives. Because why, who came, you know, who come up with the concept that our daily life actually is the struggle while the, the, the exception is where we can be uh, ourselves. Uh, so um, this is the concept of Therme and Robert, uh, there's nobody better to maybe introduce this concept a little bit. I lost you at many responsible. So <laughs> I'm many responsible for something, but I need to know about what. So uh, I'm, uh, look, I'm, 
really happy that we're having this talk today. Tomorrow we are following with a series of talk in the, in the context of the CBU Festival, which we are now doing in the third year. And uh, I'm in a talk also with Constantine, and we always have a, a, you know, a bet going who talks less. So hopefully I win tomorrow. Um, the, the context of that, and I think that this will speak a little bit about uh, uh, what we are doing at Therma Group. And basically a company like, uh, like ours should, should start with thinking about the physical infrastructure. And I think what we did and what we are doing at Therma Group and try to do is to think, uh, to think about it backwards, about the contact infrastructure and how we are creating uh, not not a physical infrastructure of our will, but a, a, a much more a, a context where we invite people to um, you know to contemplate, collaborate, and share with us the whole uh, the whole environment. Um, that's why we have initiatives like Terme Art, and we had initiatives like Terme Forum, and maybe a few sentence about the Terme Forum that uh, has a great example and a great declination what we did in Sibiu. Uh, and how this came about uh, that, uh, I think four years ago, we, we started a discussion and Sibio had a quite interesting uh, um, history. The history was not that a city was looking for a new infrastructure to create art, to create cultural production and to create uh, uh, audiences. Sibio basically created almost grassroots that audiences and that cultural production and needed an infrastructure. And when we sit down, we said, look, what we are trying to do at Terme is basically the same thing. We are trying to look what uh, the culture, uh, 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 you know, creation is outside, and we are trying to invite everybody to collaborate and to participate in creating the infrastructure. And um, we we said uh, that that the new infrastructure of the city, the new infrastructure of the new venue and the new physical space shouldn't be a product uh, uh, of will, but it should be merely a product of conversation and collaboration. So it was starting a, a series of talks uh, under our Terme Forum umbrella three years ago, peaking this year. And, and this year it's quite uh, interesting because everything changed this year, as we see that out of this conversation, out of the infrastructures of ideas, the physical infrastructure will come about. And it's, it's not imposed on the city, but it's, it's, it's brought to the city as merely as a, as a product of his, of his uh, you know, core existence and, and, and frames of, of development throughout the years. So that's a great example what I think uh, we, we, are, we are trying to do. And I think we are trying to do that on, on many layers. And um, I think to, to answer your question where we are standing as a as, uh, group and where, where we are seeing ourselves at this uh, interference about uh, you know, physical and, and, and digital spaces. I have today in a, co in, a, in a talk, a very interesting quote. Somebody said that we, we are now in a post-digital era. And um, I find that thought quite interesting because uh, I think coming back into, uh, into 2019 and looking at this year, we will all have, uh, I think, or most of us, a common understanding that the digitalization will, will move forward very strictly. And if you talk about time uh, and, and time as a factor of, of change, uh, what I think happened the last uh, three and a half, four months is that we had a tremendous acceleration of change of, of a future that was about to happen and probably also a change of that change, a change of that future that was about to happen. So I think a lot of things changed a lot and uh, our, who, who, who thought that our need to be physical with each other is so strong. And, and I think this is something that, that surprised many of us and, and, and positively surprised many of us. So to go back to, uh, to what you asked, Mikolai, um, I think where, where we are seeing also in the context of Manchester, where we, uh, we are now in a, uh, in a phase of, of bringing a, a project to, to the city, which I think will be extremely uh, uh, important for, uh, in, in this context also of, of COVID-19. Um, it's to take, the, you know, to take now the fear away that being with each other and being with each other in physical space, it's a matter of safety. In a, in, a, in a pandemic situation, but it's more a matter of, of need. And this relationship human to human, the, it, it doesn't, you know, it goes in an area where it's not transactional anymore. I think it's a, it's a, it's a basic human need. 
it's a basic human need that uh, we we didn't define it like that. I think we define it as a as a factuality, but I think it's a basic human need uh, much more than we ever thought, and probably that's uh, that's one of the good things. I was thinking a little bit about what various people said, and I think one thing that struck me, and here I'd love to throw this out to the panel, is you know on the one hand we're talking about at least in the short term, reduced numbers of people in spaces together, you know? And then I think, you know, um, Zoe made this very good point about, you know, there's a very different thing if I'm sitting here and talking to you or if I'm sitting here and talking to you like this, because I'm not there. There's, we live in a state of, of continuous partial attention if we're not careful about it. And so an optimist might say, and I'll be the optimist here, an optimist might say that, on the one hand, the crisis drives us apart or doesn't allow so many of us to be together, but that perhaps having been denied each other's presence for so long, when we're together, we'll be more engaged. You know, this would be, this would be the great thing is if people who haven't seen their friends for two months turn their phones off when they see their friends or people who haven't seen a live performance for three or four months, don't start taking pictures in the front row and lighting up the thing, you know? And I think it's a, you know, I'm, I'm curious what the panel's views are. Cause I think we have on the one knee, on the one hand, a, a, a medical, a health need not to congregate. But on the other hand, I think a human need and a cultural need to be for those who are present to be more engaged than they were in the past. Um, so I guess my question to you is, is, do you think I'm delusional in my thinking or not? S, <laughs> you're muted. You're I'm muted. Ah, yeah. Muted again. Muted again. There you go. How am I now? You're um, great. I, I wanted to dive in just because when you mention uh, the relationship between audience and, and, and performer, um, and be between each other, I, I do think this is an opportunity. I've been using this phrase, forgive me, but I've been using the phrase, a kind of renewal of vows, um, because what I had remarked, I mean, weirdly, I had just made a, a, a piece with Dave um, about um, my perception when I was arriving at some of the large scale concerts I was working on, and just responding instinctively, my, my perception was that I was looking, if I had arrived from another planet, I would think that the people attending the concert were actually the, the glowing screens and that the blobby things underneath them were like sort of quite sophisticated consorts or chaperones or, or sort of transport devices for the glowing screens. Uh, that, that's what it was beginning to look, to, to look like. Um, and there were interventions being made by, by some performers saying, look, please, uh, we're here in the same time, let's interact with one another. And I do think um, as we tentatively begin to try to come back together, it'll probably be outside. Um, and I think the, the sort of terms of engagement between audience and performer will be revised. I, I keep thinking about the terms of engagement of drivers. Um, drivers are respectful of one another's safety. They respect the two meter rule on the highway um, because they, they want to be safe. They want the person in front of them to be safe and they have passed the highway code. Um, and I, and I, I believe that we may have to enter into something like that kind of mutual responsibility towards one another as we start to come back together. And, and my, I guess my closest experience of it was when working on large Olymp Olympic ceremonies, when we cast you know, huge members of, uh, huge numbers of members of the public uh, as part of mass movement moments. Um, these are people who are not you know, professional performers. So in a way, the audience perhaps comes on that set of terms of engagement. They come as participant. And maybe, maybe that's, that, that's a sort of you know, re return perhaps to how theater began, which was as ritual as participation. Um, and, and when I was a, a teenager, we went to the Rocky Horror Show in the eighties and we dressed up and we knew the call and response. We knew what our role was. We had to say this bit here, we had to wear this thing. So maybe the wearing of protective masks could be attacked uh, 
as an adventure as something that's uh, you know a, a place to to set our imaginations um, and maybe the spacing between us there's ways to create exquisite beautiful geometry top projected geometry um, like we do in big uh, Olympic ceremonies. Um, and maybe, as you say, this sort of terms of engagement, this, I love your phrase, um, Zoe, of co-presence. I, I, I wrote that down. I'm going to, I'm afraid now, that's my new word along with anti-fragile, anti-fragile and co-presence um, and group liveness. I was just writing those down while, while you were speaking. I think that they're, they're fantastic phrases. So I think if we can cultivate anti-fragile co-presence and this hiatus, and we know that these hiatus is, have happened before. We know that they happen periodically in Shakespeare's time. Um, this hiatus is a time for us to sort of grow, look at everything. I mean, I've been phoning heads of West End theatres going, let's just remind ourselves that most of what goes on in those spaces is not great. You know, it's not inclusive demographically, socially, racially, age-wise, finance-wise, you know, let's take this moment to, to make some big sweeping revisions that we needed to make anyway. Yeah. I think there's also another important element to this, uh, that if you want to be together, really together with another person, you have to make yourself vulnerable. Yeah. And uh, this is something for, for this, you need a space. That's actually something that Frida Escobedo, when, um, when we had the last conversation, uh, she uh, told us that this was this piazzas, you know, in, in Mexico, where people, they, they had a like certain ambiguity, so you could just go there and uh, the old people would use them in their way, the young people would use them completely different. They were not predefined as a function and they were open for everything, like a kind of uh, city as a theater, yeah, where, where the play happens just spontaneously and the people can because they own it, they know that this is their space, this is their safe space. And, and um, I think the capitalistic, um, the, extreme cap the extreme form of capitalistic uh, economy created spaces that are not belonging to the people. They are somehow rented to the people or sold to the people on a temporary basis, but they're not really feeling like home. And the question I think uh, here to all of us is how we can um, uh, how we can apply the practice of you guys, because we are creating festivals, museums, shows, communities, to something that is uh, that 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 we can build, yeah. And this is where 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 our group is also uh, extremely interested in, and uh, this is why why Robert and me uh, founded this term art program uh, to see how we can infuse into real build a structure because building is complicated, right? So for building, Robert was mentioning, I think five times the word infrastructure. So infrastructure is something that you really need to build, you need to plan it. So this is maybe why it very often turns out to be very simple because you can only invest in simple things not to do anything wrong. But I think now we have to step up the game and I loved what Franklin said, actually, that uh, our future was just changed. And this is a big, big chance for us, you know, so to apply artistic practice directly into in, in, into our real lives, not only outside. John, you are, you are, um, you, you, you seem to, <laughs> you seem to be on, on the same page. Yeah, I'm, I mean, Robert said something, uh, I think you, you said the phrase um, infrastructure as a product of conversation. Uh, yes. And I think that that sense that infrastructure should be a pro product of conversation as opposed to a product of economy and power structures is, is a very good starting point. And, and I think at, at the moment, certainly in the, the world of arts organizations, much of the conversation has been quite institutional and quite institutionalized. When we talk about the return from COVID, it's all about how do we do social distancing in theaters, et cetera. But I think as your point is that we need to look at what was going on there previously in the first place and was it any good and actually maybe return to the artists and ask the artists for better ways to congregate and to for ways to congregate that, that are more co-present uh, as you say Zoe. Uh, we, we're working with a dozen plus artists at the moment around work for, for next summer for the festival and he, every conversation with them has to be placed in a um, a state of provisionality that we wouldn't usually be doing at this point. We'd be saying, okay, we know it's these dates, we know it's in this space, we know what the creative team is, we, we're beginning to sense what it will look like. 
But now every conversation actually has to start by, if none of that can happen, what's most important about this project, about this inquiry, and how do we hold on to that? So I think that sense that there's a different quality of conversation with artists and that the, the answer to these questions about how we gather is inherently a creative one rather than an institu institutional one is something that, that um, we should very much hold on to. I was thinking, Let me John, to that. I think, uh, I think it's, it's, it's quite important uh, what you said, and, and I'm, I'm completely agreeing with that. If, if you look at how infrastructure is creating now, infrastructure is basically creating by a justifiable need. It's not just the need of it, the economical need of it, but also a need that needs to be mathematical or classical in a kind of a structure, mostly a power structure, justifiable about that. And, and the question is how you create vision. Vision is need but ahead of time. Need is uh, reverting a kind of a, a kind of historical piling of, of uh, I, I will say inequalities or, or, or things that uh, basically uh, didn't balance or didn't get into to an ecosystem. So uh, I, I think that will be an interesting challenge to, to, to what will happen after this post-COVID era, because the, that, th this time gets us thinking about, I think, one fundamental concept. Uh, four months ago, the human being was the only source who drive change, who drive climate change, who drive any kind of change. And, and what happened now is that nature drove this change. So basically it got reverted as, as the human being who was uh, in charge for the good and the bad to be out of charge, to be, to be you know, put aside and nature took over and, and, and drove a kind of a change where, where human beings are now responding to. So I think these two fundamental things that uh, involve contemplation, conversation, and, and, and humility uh, in the end uh, are, are, are fundamental to any kind of infrastructure. And in the last, I think, six, seven years, almost I'm, I'm not referring an, uh, at infrastructure, almost exclusively on non-physical infrastructure. So I'm, I'm, I'm referring most of it as infrastructure of, of human beings, of thoughts, of, of things that can be built because the, 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 the physical part of it, it's, it's, it's the end product of that. I'm, I'm usually not interested in that because that will come about exactly how it should come about. The, the, the first part are we are more interested about. So uh, I, I, I think that's extremely important to, to revert that. Sorry, I think you, I, I interrupted you, Mark. Oh, I was actually going to, um, I was thinking, you know, John had said that, that um, infrastructure is a result of conversations, but you can also flip it around and say the conversations are the result of infrastructure, that you can create an infrastructure which creates conversations. And I think, um, you know, I think probably of everyone on the panel, I work on the shortest timelines because we do three fairs per year, you know, and I think um, within the art world, museums are the ones that work on the longest timelines, just because often they're doing complicated shows, they're lending works, they're borrowing works, they're doing works with other institutions. And I think, you know, as Robert pointed out, as our brother John pointed out, we're in this moment of, of conditional planning, you know, and then I guess my question to Zoe and to Franklin would be, you know, to the extent that you're the people who have the most permanent infrastructures on this panel, you know, that you have buildings which are, can be opened, can be used for different things than they're, they were intended to be. And be, to the extent that your, your planning cycles are thrown off by everything that's happening, you know, how are you, re or how, do, or are you rethinking, you know, sort of the, the role of the museum in terms of spurring physical conversations as those things become more possible? What do you see do you see the museum as a stage for a sort of unplanned, undirected conversation as a stage for, you know, what's, what's, the, what's the role there? And I'm not suggesting it wasn't there before, but it feels, is it, is it more urgent? Is it different? Um, how do you think about the, the way you coalesce a crowd and, and then catalyze conversations? Well, Chisholm Hale is a gallery, so more like a Kunsthalle model. So we yeah. don't have a permanent collection. Um, we have one um, incredibly adaptable, um, large windowless space that we kind of transform usually four times a year. So um, one of the things that has driven my thinking has actually been 
a slightly antithetical way of thinking about that. And it goes back to um, that careful consideration of organizational DNA. Uh, we were founded by artists in the 1980s. Um, and my first priority is to honor the commitments we made to artists who were displaced by um, COVID. So my thinking in terms of reopening and working very closely with um, a very dedicated team is to honor um, those three exhibitions that would have otherwise happened this year and couldn't. So again, that, that way of thinking about a schedule that one has to keep to, I think we're small and nimble enough where actually the right thing to do in this instance is to um, slow things down and program slightly differently. And as we think ahead, precisely what you're saying about um, conversations emerging and a more discursive way of working. Um, I've been thinking a lot about um, who we share a building with. We're in a former varnish factory in East London and one of our um, fellow residents is a Chisholm Hale dance space. So I think that in a very real way, we can rethink what liveness means in relation to um, the exhibition format, in relation to commissioning and how we work. Um, that will also, for all of the reasons that have been mentioned, likely mean rethinking how that's disseminated. It might not be that we're like all sweaty, shoulder to shoulder, crowded in the room together as much as I want that to happen, um, but that we might be creating um, a safe space in a physical sense in which performance might take place and that then be broadcast or disseminated in some other way or that thinking can take place in different ways. That's also something that was a big part of my thinking um, working at Tate and collaborating with colleagues like Catherine Wood, um, which resulted in um, the performances that were about to happen with um, Tanya Lucan Linklater and Fustan Linye Kula and the absolutely formidable um, Okuya Pokwasili. So there are ways of thinking about how what is meant to be something fixed. Um, by the time you've, all the ideas are fluid until they cohere, they coalesced in some kind of presentation, ta-da! And then what changes are the people who move through the space. I think that there's more scope for us to think about um, how the format of our commissioning will change. Um, and I think to the point that John made, a lot of that will be artist led as artists rethink what feels urgent or necessary. Um, the way that we want to be critical friends and stewards of artists kind of most ambitious ideas is going to be evolving. So I'm excited to be a part of what changes, but I don't have a foregone conclusion. Uh, thank you. I, I would love to hear from Franklin also, and I would uh, add to the question of Mark. So uh, our Wellbeing Culture Forum is uh, also about uh, creating a manifesto, and I will ask everybody of you for one sentence later. Maybe you can already start to think about it. What would be the right sentence to add to a manifesto of a better city, of a better space for human beings? Um, and Franklin, as you are running this institution that has already the tradition of being developed out of a movement, not planned from the beginning as something stable, but planned, uh, not planned, but just uh, developed out of our urgency, our urgent situation. Um, uh, how, how you see now this new future developing, you know, because you are, it's like you're taking now a turn into hopefully the right direction. How you see, or we are taking it, how you see your institution repositioning in, in this context? Absolutely. Uh, on, on one hand, we are an institution now in the sense that, you know, we have a collection that we've worked very hard to grow in the last five years in particular. And so I'm excited about getting to, to see the fruit of that, to see what kind of thematics and what kind of juxtapositions we can create with all of this work that we've collected that we don't have not had the opportunity to actually present until this point. That's exciting. For us, being in a place like this, outdoors is the new indoors in many ways. 
right? So we're thinking about programming outside. Why not? Um, I watched a Dave Chappelle uh, special a couple of days ago, and it was brilliant. No, he's sitting outside. He's in a sort of amphitheater. People are socially distanced. Everybody can hear, and it's a different type of experience. We're not trying to squish everybody in. As much as I love the, there's so many um, elements of physicality and coming together that we all miss so dearly right now, but I really appreciate what Mark said in regard to, do we hold these moments in a different regard when we see each other again? I can't imagine seeing somebody at a fair right now and walking through them or December at Art Basel, walking by them and actually worrying about my phone like I inevitably do and have done in the past. I think it will truly be a different moment for us to appreciate each other's physical being. And, and I really look forward to that in a deep way. By the same token, I also think between a couple of museum experiences that we've all had. So last year, at one point, I found myself thinking about the Manil collection in Houston where I used to work. And this building in this little neighborhood, right? Built by Renzo Piano to be a big inside uh, of a small place. And um, it was surrounded by little bungalows. So how do you let it still be a part of that character? And then you go inside and it's a place where you're most often, you have a confrontation with beautiful works of art that is often a solitary one. You know, it's not this kind of audience or attendance driven event. And then I think back to being in the Louvre last year and trying to see a picture where really what I was taking a picture with was not a picture, it was a picture of people. And it was about the congregation of people all trying to see the same darn thing. Um, so I love these two kind of poles, these opposites. And I look forward to getting back to those. But the one thing that I would say is a guiding light for us within this moment. And it makes me think of, of my, my old friend, Cesar Garcia in, in Los Angeles is mistakes, right? He runs a place called the Mistake Room. And although we are an institution with a collection, a significant one, um, and we can do those things and we're gonna do those things, we also have to be ready to take mistakes, to make mistakes and say that, what the hell, let's see what happens. Can we do a show that is, is a new way of thinking of things? Can we think curatorially in ways that are innovative and unique and take into account our new situation? I hope so. I don't know exactly what that looks like, but I know as a director in this moment that we are being forced to change. Our budgets will all change. And I hope that we feel as though we can uh, make some mistakes and try some things that aren't gonna work and, and figure out what does. Yeah, that's actually super beautiful. I, I, I think the courage to make mistakes will prevent much bigger mistakes. This is something that, uh, that, that I think is uh, something we can take out of this, uh, this talk that the courage to do mistakes and, is, is, and is- So much of this moment, sorry, Nikolai. Please. But so much of this moment is about learning from each other Please. and recognizing and, 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 and I think absorbing uh, from other people. So for us to also let go of some of the, the reins or some of the power structures that we all know uh, need to be reconsidered in this moment will potentially put us in a better situation. I have one question that is directly related to this that I want to direct to Konstantin, um, or as you wanted to say something, sorry, uh, you well, raise your hand. So. I mean, uh, Franklin, I so agree with what you're well, everything that you're saying, but I, I particularly agree with, with this question of, of, of courage and, and between us as a community, I, wa I wanted to just sort of put something to everybody that I've been thinking a lot about, which is now that we know how much we can do by Zoom, do we as a community of artists and uh, curators and people involved in cultural, do we set ourselves some kind of flight budget um, 
because I was shocked. I just got an email today from someone who wants me to judge something. They said, okay, well, you'll do two nights here and you'll fly. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> you, no, surely not. Surely to judge something, I don't need to go there. You know, do we not now in this moment, all of us, and it would have to be all of us together. We'd have to literally, I mean, one of the things I wanted to touch on, Zoe, when you mentioned uh, that Chisholm dance and Chisholm um, the gallery starts to fuse is I one thing I'm sure all of you have found and I've certainly found in this period is a, a new porosity between the institutions I've never spoken so much I've never had so many institutions that are normally siloed now suddenly becoming gorgeously porous to one another and can we during one of these big town halls all agree some kind of contract with each other where you know we can do a panel like this normally all of us would be getting on flights to do this and surely we've got to come out of this going when do we fly and when do we not fly because we're all culprits in it um how do we do that i'd love to know everyone's thoughts on that Mikolai, you are a great traveler how are you going to yeah. stop man come on uh you have to you have to invite the world to come into your head i mean i think this is something that i learned now to, during this uh, lockdown that uh, most of the things, uh, even if you travel, most of the things are still happening in your head. You know, so basically you can travel there also without moving. And this is what we are doing basically with this Wellbeing Culture Forum. We couldn't take it off uh, with all the panelists, uh, like traveling to one place to talk with each other. When we do it this way, uh, uh, it's actually much more productive. So there are things, especially rational thinking, everything that you can do with words, you can do uh, online. I mean, I've been thinking um, a lot about the, the the paradigm of the football match on the TV in the pub. So what you get there is a, a group of people who are a community. They're not alone on their phones. They are together. They have that, you know, physical corporeal togetherness and they're physically local, but they are watching something that's digital and global. So they're part of a digital global community and physical local community. Could we like John, you know, partner Manchester International Festival, um, you know, could we partner that together with Constantine's festival? So you have a cross broadcast. So all of that extraordinary stuff that Constantine just described to us. And by the way, man, I just want to be there <laughs> and see all of it. Uh, could those two cross pollinate? So you have a physical local community in Manchester, another physical local community in, in your city, and then you cross pollinate you, you you cross broadcast them i mean could we be doing that with fashion could we be doing that with music could i have you know billy eilish is performing in la and dua lipa is performing in london and there's a physical local attendance and then a you know cross broadcast digital global attendance so we because the biggest you know as as you know the the biggest carbon footprint tragically from our mass gatherings is the audience arriving this is the terrible thing, even if we didn't have any lights and we didn't have any scenery and we literally just put the band on the stage, our, our most, our hugest part of the pie chart of the carbon footprint is the audience getting there. Um, so I, I, I'd love to know what everybody thinks. Is there any hope for us, you know, yeah. trying to take this lack of you know, di diminished flying? Do we give ourselves a budget and we say to our collaborators when they say can you come here you just say well i'm sorry i've used up my flight budget for this year i, I, I think uh, this is a, a extremely interesting a very personal perspective because we are really thinking how you can apply it directly in your life right um and and you're also applying it i mean you're also talking about the the, the cultural sphere that uh, that we are somehow connected to um, but outside this cultural sphere, there's also this big world that is basically flying all the time and producing goods and services. And, you know, all this is also happening. And actually what you want to do now, what you just propose is to apply a cultural practice that we could already apply, yeah, that we are already applying, uh, what we could develop in culture to our daily lives. Uh, but um, this, uh, this transition 
from cultural practice into daily life, this is something that uh, I think we can learn a lot from because we can we can experience, we can develop, we can basically create so many other forms of you know of coexistence of meeting together. We we for example just did uh, our Burning Man camp that we planned to do at Burning Man in Nevada. We did it online. So Artu Manumani created the catharsis structure that we planned this year to build. Uh, at Burning Man uh, online, and we did already, you know, all the gatherings around it, and everybody with the Oculus glasses or through through the PC directly uh, visited uh, the space, and it also recreated a form of gathering that 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 we could uh, that that we could enjoy very much, not at all comparable with the live event of Burning Man, but very much uh, going into a direction where you can have a taste of future. You know that it's not yet there, but it's a taste of it. But what I wanted to ask everybody, and I wanted to start with Constantine, because this is... Can I, can I just say, say my yeah, opinion on what Es says, because I think it's, it's great. So first of all, I think our CFO is also in this line. He is in London. He will love that because he hates flights budget. So if, if we can tell him that we are cutting all our flight budget, we, we are on a different trajectory. So, so that's a great thing. <laughs> uh, on, on, on what I think about it, I think that's a fundamental question because I think the question it's about how we are valuing human interaction as a new kind of valuing that. So are you traveling to Beijing for a meeting or are you traveling around the world you know, to hug one of your parents? What's the value of that human interaction? And that value of the human interaction just changed because now it was mainly transactional and it was mainly driven by a kind of a, you know, uh, um, as it is uh, economical need or, or, or a practical need. But I think what, what changed and I, and I think what changed for us and, and for me personally is that I'm looking at this thing not in a matter of a transaction, but in a matter of value of, of the human interaction. And I think you, you see that. Uh, if we need uh, in, next year, we will be at a, uh, at, at a CBU festival, we'll be at the at uh, at Manchester festival, and for that we will be need to be physical, I think, and and the word life need to change in the word alive probably because you know uh, I, I was thinking about what you said in the beginning of the conversation, and that word life was just you know managing our fear back in the 50s that we are not you know seeing the same thing as other people saw in the same time so it was about managing our fear that it's life it's happening just now and and if you're if you're talking about the concerts of yesterday where everybody's sitting with the phone you can argue that they, they were not live you know they had on the phone the same thing live so it's not happening for them in the same moment but if you take that phone away now, after the, that, that kind of interaction, then everybody can be alive. So you have a live events, you have live events from home, and you have uh, this kind of interaction on, on Zoom that we are doing now. Sorry, just I, three I think, words. I think, I know. Can I, before you, because I have to ask this question, it's a totally crucial question, um, and you all can judge if you want to answer it. Um, my question is like this, Constantine was telling us how he managed to, to raise the budget of the city of Sibiu to 14%, what is the largest budget of, for culture. Uh, I want to ask a very provocative question. Please. Why can't we do it upside down? Why can't, uh, the, isn't the festival the better city? Couldn't be culture the main content of a city, John? Couldn't the Manchester International Festival be the city of Manchester? Couldn't the budget uh, for culture be 80% of the culture? I mean, it's a provocative question, but shouldn't we see in the wake of automatization, in the wake of uh, like all the investment forums that we are participating in, all the big hedge funds, they are all investing now in human related services, yeah? No. In services, no. because they we know- We are that talking too much, be, believe uh, me. Yes. The, 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 the things are more simple. Look, the sun is giving us the light and also what means the life. And it's not, not asking something back. Last year, the theme of the festival was the art of giving. So if us as creators, as producers, if we are doing something without to wait something back. We are building another kind of audience. What I said, I got from many presidents, emperors and so on, 
a lot of awards. The best award that I'm receiving late in the night when I'm leaving my office at two, three o'clock, I'm jumping in a taxi. And there were so many moments when the taxi drivers said, Constantine, you are not paying. It's the biggest price. So we have the content. Now I have five different shows already produced, able to be online, but able to be also on the, on the stage. I have 68 actors that are working daily, the chair of poetry and stories. And at nine o'clock each evening, all the kids from my community, but not only from CBU, from entirely Romania, and everything is translated in English, in German, in French, the kids can hear stories, can hear poetry. In the same time, I have so many conferences with the best personalities, so I can produce this. So I have solutions. What Robert said, now the biggest challenge in Sibiu is what will be the way to have a new building of the theater, a center of congresses, and an institute of research to bring everything that we achieved already. Because we don't need now to fight to bring a bank. For my festival, I have eight banks that are fighting to be partner with me because they need my visibility, my quality in what I'm working with all the public. When you have in two months and a half, nearly 3 million visitors in what we produced. And we did an improvisation from March till in this festival. And there was 3 million visitors. Nobody got this amount of, of uh, visitors. So everybody, they want to be together with us. All the banks, all the producers, all the sponsors and so on. So it is about miracle. It is about quality. It's about what I said, building trust. So this is Mark. You uh, you you had a, you had a, um, a comment here, but but I think it's going in this direction. Can we make the city a festival? Can the city become a theater? Can this become please our main um, content of our lives? The, the no. No, we might take care of what means the people from each community. If we are paying attention of their celebrations, if we are looking what religion they have and all the celebrations in a year, what are the natural celebrations coming from the seasons? What are the job celebrations? And if we are doing a culture agenda related to the people, they will be together with you and they will pay attention in what you are doing with them. If you are taking care for their kids, believe me, I know to say by heart, three weeks entirely poems. So I can give for everybody a gift. And what I'm teaching to my students, also to my uh, collaborators is to give, not to wait to say, give me. No, I'm giving you. And if you are giving each day, and if you are paying attention for each person from your community, for sure you are a, a winner. I was going to say, I think, and maybe I'll play the devil's advocate here. You know, I think interaction is important to culture and interaction requires travel, Absolutely. you know? And so I think as much as the city can become a better cultural organism and a stage for culture and a stage for protest and a stage for education and a stage for conversation, you don't want the city to close in on itself. Absolutely. And I think, I think what, what's important when we think about travel is the same as 
is when we think about work, I don't believe for a second this kind of Greta Thunberg idea that the planes are going to stay on the ground. You know, we, they're already taking off. But I think in the same way that we now question, did I need to go into work to do a kickoff meeting or a status quo meeting? You know, yeah, yes, people brainstorm better together. There's no question about it. People learn better together. You know, the, for me, you know, we, we brought two um, Manchester International Festival uh, performances to Art Basel. We brought 14 rooms. We brought Temple del Postino. Nothing you could do with video or VR would equal being in those performances. In the same way, you know, Franklin and I have become friends because we've become, we've been stranded in some very strange places and not, I wouldn't say forced because I love Franklin, I always have, but I mean like, like we've had the opportunity to get stuck on buses together going around Qatar, you know? Um, we've been waiting in lines to get into clubs in Miami, you know? we've. Of course, we've also toured our museums and the shows, but I think the point is that, that it's not the travel will disappear. I think that we have to think about how we spend it. I don't even want to focus on the planes. It's like, how do we spend our time? Who do we spend our time with? Who do we travel? What is the focus of our energies in building the cities around us? What is the focus of energies in building institutions around us? You know, and I think... I mean, I can say personally, and I'm not proud nor ashamed of it, like this has not been a period where I've been reading a lot of books or watching a lot of movies. Like I've been trying to keep things moving. I've been in, I've had longer conversations with friends that I've had sometimes in person, sometimes not in person, sometimes virtually, you know. Um, and it's been a very rich time in that sense. But I think you know, we have to continue those. We have to say, you know what, it's better to Franklin's point about running past each other, you know, at a fair, because that's what you do, you know, um, to be where you are, you know, and not in your phone, you know, and, but your phone also has its moment, of course, because it connects us to lots of people. And I think in a sense, you know, if this, and I don't, I really hate this kind of silver linings thing. Like I wish COVID-19 had never happened. It's going to have a terrible effect on people. And those people are going to be predominantly poor and darker skin than the rest of the world. So let's not pretend that this is a good thing. It is a terrible no. catastrophe with some silver linings. And, you know, if it, re, if it forces us to rethink how we relate to each other, if it forces us to step away from our phones, if it forces us to build cities that are more open to culture and to each other, that's a good thing. We should have gotten there by ourselves, but as a society, we didn't have the maturity to do it. But I think in a sense, you know, we as all of us, as people who stage events, I think have to think about how do we make those events where places are, are where people choose to be, prioritize, they don't just show up you know, to show face. And then they're really present so that real things happen when we interact with each other in physical spaces. And I think that to me is kind of the challenge of the, the future of live events. Like how do we make every event count? How do we make every presence count? How do we make every trip count? You know, and not just how to do things because everyone else is doing it. You know, we have to put aside the FOMO, you know, um, you know, maybe it's not, it shouldn't be fear of missing out. Maybe it's fear of missed opportunities. Like we travel when there's an opportunity to do something real and not just to show up so people knew we were there. I That's totally my... agree with what you said. We did this festival because we are taking care for our spectators. And what I said from the beginning, the biggest achievement was to build the new audience, to transform, you know, the citizens that hadn't any possibilities to see in the communism time, the real dialogue between artists traveling from all over the world and being in a community. And this was the biggest gift that I gave to them. So being, you know, for two months and a half, three months nearly, all of them like in a prison in their houses, Nobody doing something for them it was my duty and our duty to give them a little beauty, a little dream, a little poetry. 
And this was really extraordinary for them. So coming from here, we are building again all these relations with them. So I think it's the most important because if we as artists, producers, if we are not thinking that each spectator, it's very important and they have kids, they have relatives, they have a lot of pain. Some of them are maybe not in a good healthy. And if we are bringing something for them daily, they will trust us forever. This is exactly so, uh, Kanzani, thank you. So this is the festival as a therapy, as a, as a therapy for masses uh, to speak with Elias Canetti. Uh, and I think there is a very uh, valid point that uh, the city should be healing and not, uh, and not uh, destroying uh, human lives. And I think um, if we would, as we sit here, build a city together, the city would be a completely different city, but we are not thinking in this ways. We are thinking in institutions, we are thinking in temporary projects, we are basically, you know, uh, creating events, creating, uh, creating festivals, but, uh, but I, I think we can create a city. I want to share the screen just for one second, just to show you one, um, this is especially for us, uh, one visualization of the project where we already received the building permit. So this is not a crazy um, visualization, this is a buildable, uh, object that is already permitted for Manchester and it will reduce one thing um, extremely, uh, it will reduce um, the tourism that is going out of Manchester to be in a warm tropical environment. This is basically what, uh, what, what, what we are trying to build and what you can see here, what is already totally complex uh, to achieve is that we change the way, you know, how you usually structure a building it's uh, organic, it, it works with biomimicry. Robert can say something about this uh, uh, in detail. What I, what, what I wanted to, to, to share with you is just a thought that we can rethink the city. We can basically build whatever we want based on the experience that we have and the cultural practice that we have. So the festival can become the city on a long term. And uh, I would like to, maybe as a, as, as a closing round to ask everybody out of your, your uh, experience uh, now, the experience that we had in the past, basically three, four months of the year 2020, what would be the sentence that you would like to add to a manifesto of a better city, of a manifesto of a city that you would like to live in and that you would like your children uh, to live in, maybe Zoe. If, uh... oh, I'm ready. I'm so excited about this because um, I've been really inspired by Marcus Rashford. Um, for those of you who aren't in England, um, obviously um, Great Britain is uh, a unit out of many countries. And um, with the schools closing soon for summer, even some that have only partially reopened, um, both Scotland and Wales, we're going to carry on um, offering uh, meals to children who need them over the summer months. And if it weren't for um, a very phenomenal young man who's a footballer named Marcus Rasford, who knows um, hunger from lived experience, um, campaigning for the government to U-turn in England so that the children who need it have lunches here as well, then many, many children would be going hungry um, between mid-July and September when they went back to school. So um, for me, um, I think that, and this, this includes artists, this includes so many people, but to sum it up, for me, a better city uplifts its most vulnerable. Thank you very much. S? Oh, we have to unmute. Cultivate an anti-fragility. Oh, very good. That I think are extremely important uh, topic to make the system growing out, you know, through stress and through pressure to a more complex um, and more probably, because in complexity, there's something that is beautiful and in the same time uh, strong. 
yeah, to be more beautiful and stronger. Yeah, John. Well, I'll, I'll just start by, of course, saying that Zoe meant to add that Marcus Rashford is, of course, Manchester United footballer. So uh, just to own own him a little in all his glory. Um, for me, the 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 best cities, like the best festivals, are are profoundly local and profoundly international, and they're never nationalistic. Um, so those would be on um, the principles that I'd want to pursue. And then in terms of a line for the manifesto, um, re relating to a lot of things that we said, to, to create a city, as cities have always been, as a place of exchange, but of fair and equal exchange. Thank you. Robert? Well, uh, a lot have been said today and, and, and a lot of great things I think will come out of this conversation, but uh, you know, probably uh, if I have to give a kind of a quote of a city, I will say, you know, there was never a better time. Like, I think it's every day the best time to uh, conversate, contemplate, collaborate and share in a city. Thank you. Franklin, what is your take on that? Uh, these are all so good. Create a, a governmental position of empathy. Um, we need that now more than ever, and they should have oversight over every elected official in every single municipality. That's so beautiful, and that's so true. Um, Konstantin? So, community is the meaning of a country. And it is so important to have the right persons who are leading the communities in a country with a good policy. To be, in a way, a little bit quite near to the creators and to understand what means the beauty of human beings, what means to, to, to be with the legs on the earth, but also able to play with your hands, the stars. That's uh, very poetic and I think very true. Mark, you're wrapping it up, but you have to um, demute yourself. Mark, you're muted. Mark? Mark. Yes. Okay, sorry. I was going to say these are all these are all very hard acts to follow, and and when you go last, everything has always been almost always been said. But I feel, you know, Le Corbusier said that a a house, a building, is a machine for living, and so the question is, what is a what is a great city? And I think a great city is a machine for taking all of the chaos, the complexity within it, and ensuring that each of its citizens creates something as part of something that is more than the sum of its individual parts. That a machine is creates opportunity. Uh, a city creates opportunities for everybody within it. That would be impossible without the others there. Perfect. Yeah. So thank you very much. My wish is that uh, that that we are building the city together. I think this is really possible, and uh, that we can, you know, uh, rely on your practice. And, uh, and we are very, very happy that you participated in this talk. Mark, thank you so much for co-hosting it. I want to invite you all um, at this moment um, when we wrap it up to the next talk that will happen on the 24th of June about uh, the social culture of cities shaping our participatory reality with uh, Emma Dexter from the British Council, Sonia Boyce, uh, the next artist representing uh, UK at the Architectural Biennale, Elvira Diangani also, creator and director, David Cohn from Cohn Architects, Seda Levinson from the South Park Center, Gavin Wader and Susie Wilson. And, um, and in this context, uh, we will also to continue to, to talk with you. And uh, we very much hope that, you know, we, we will not only talk, but also realize uh, some of these ideas uh, in, our, in our building projects, so simple as it is. Thank you very much for participating, and thank you also to the listeners and viewers, and talk soon. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.